Welcome to Green and Red, Scrappy Politics for Scrappy People, a regular podcast on radical environmental and anti capitalist politics. Brought to you by Bob Bazanko and Scott Parkin. Welcome to the Silky Smooth Sounds of the Green and Red Podcast. I'm your co host, Scott Parkin, in San Francisco, California today. And as always, I am joined by I'm, uh, Bob Bazanko in the United States of America, as Groucho Marx called it. Snakes. That's, he that's did that good. he did that on his show and um the fbi started a file because i got so many protests from people calling him a communist because he said the united snakes of america so that's what i'm gonna start using we'll put i'm sure that's gonna end up in your file once that he's my episode. he's my second favorite marks after carl, <laughs> carl and groucho carl and groucho yeah so today so it's memorial day and we are going to be talking about we're going to give a, a brief history of U.S. war and empire and all of the different things that went into that. We won't go on too long for you today, but we did think that the holiday, which I'm sure everyone's out in their backyard doing barbecues or going to the ball game or whatever, and posting really great memes on their social media about how to honor the heroes and stuff. We're going to talk a little bit about Memorial Day from a different angle today. But first, we're going to pay tribute to uh, historian Bruce Franklin. I'm going to hand it off to Bob for that. Yeah, it's Memorial Day weekend, and so these actually fit together quite well. Memorial Day is often heroicized and romanticized, and this is not in any way to insult veterans and soldiers where we were just speaking a moment ago about how important VDAW was and uh, a lot of anti-war vet groups today, so that's not the point. But the, the day has clearly been heroicized and romanticized, and it's become kind of a, a, a point of, of rallying for war and and empire, and considering the United States is involved in two really uh, profound and very bloody and, and important and consequential wars right now, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, Memorial Day uh, and what it really means and what the basis of the United States is, what the core values of the United States are. But as you pointed out, I do want to say a few words about uh, a great, well, not really a historian, a scholar, uh, H. Bruce Franklin, a very well-known scholar, who just died a few days ago, and really one of, the, I think, the more important leftist scholars in the late 20th, early 21st century, not really usually associated with the new left, but in the same period. Bruce Franklin got his PhD at Stanford, was in, I believe, the English department there, and he became, I think, the only tenured professor during the Vietnam era who was fired. He was fired from Stanford in 1972, he spent the rest of his academic career at the University of Rutgers in Newark, I believe in the American Studies Department. But he was fired. And this is really, I think, relevant right now because of what we're seeing on these campuses and how just a, what was it, a couple of days ago at Harvard, the Harvard Corporation told 13 graduating uh, seniors that they would not be allowed. I don't know if they like weren't allowed to just attend the thing or they pulled their degrees because of their protest against Harvard's in, investments in, in Israel. So I think Bruce Franklin's story is even more instructive than ever. But he was giving a speech in, at an anti-war rally in 1971 at Stanford. And he said, see, now what we're asking is for people to make that little tiny gesture to show that we're willing to inconvenience ourselves a little bit and to begin to shut down the most obvious machinery of war, such as, and I think it's a good target, that computation center. All right. So it was basically saying we need to do something and let's shut down the computer center, right? He was found guilty by Stanford on three charges, inciting student disruptions. Stanford fired him in 1972. He was the only tenured professor to be fired from Harvard, I believe at the time, maybe in the U.S. Uh, I'm not sure. I know people like Stott Lynn were fired, but Stott wasn't tenured yet. It was a huge national issue that brought a lot of attention about academic freedom and freedom of speech, which is exactly what we're, we're going through today, right now. And so I think it's important to understand Bruce's scholarship is also exemplary. He did a, a, a significant number. He wrote, I think, 10, 12 books, and I'm not going to talk about all of them. But in my field in particular, the most important were war stars. And Bruce really dealt with that kind of locus between pop culture and the way countries actually behave. War Stars was about weapons in the American imagination. He edited a book about the Vietnam War with Marilyn Young and others, uh, which was really great. And for my purposes, a book that I used in class many times, which I think is just really, in a lot of ways, sorry about that, forgot to, to mute this. In, in my estimation, one of the better books I've ever read 
in taking a, a popular myth, which is what we're going to do after this, right? The, the myth of Memorial Day in America's wars abroad and things like that. He took part of popular myth and debunked it. And that's a, a book called MIA or Myth Making in America, which was about the POW MIA myth, which was very potent back in the 70s and 80s and into the 90s, right? This idea that there were still hundreds of Americans who had been captured and kidnapped by uh, the Viet Cong who were still being held captive after the war had ended. And Bruce systematically just destroyed that uh, argument. It, it reminds me of books like uh, Jerry Lemke's book on the spitting image, right? That's mm -hmm. being spat upon, right? And if he had done nothing but MIA or myth-making in America, he would have been worth remembering. But he obviously did so much more than that. His latest book was just a more generic history of the United States called Crash Course from the Good War to the Forever War. Talked about terrorism, things like that. He was still active on social media not that long ago. Just a, a really great guy. He was also an environmentalist, I believe, wasn't he? He yeah. actually did environmental work too, didn't he? And he did a book which actually led to uh, legislation being passed in Congress. He wrote a book about the Menhaden fish or the pogey, uh, which yeah. is a keystone species in the ocean, uh, which is which is one of the things that sort of keeps the the cycle of life going in the ocean because it feeds off of smaller organisms and is fed on by larger organisms. It's also something that's actually pretty critical in the sort of food chain of humans, which includes like fish oil. And it's used even in things like greasing of machines and things like that. It also led to the ending of whale fat being used for that. But instead, the, the pogey is used for that, too. And like you said, he's had very much like an interdisciplinary scholarly approach and was in, in many fields and had an impact in all of them. Yeah, didn't he um, write about science fiction, too? And I think... Uh... It's pop culture kind of stuff. Just a, a really he, important. He was he was a curator for a Star Trek exhibit at a at a science fiction. Museum. Oh really? Really? Yeah. Uh, but also, War Stars actually dives yeah. into some of that sci fi sort yeah. of pop culture of Star Trek and Star Wars. And yeah, he did a lot of that. He did a lot of that. Just a, a really great guy, and and a, certainly a, a life worth living. He lived to be ninety. Just and, and he was even as recently as twenty twenty, he was outspoken in support of like movements in the street that he said. Yeah. In 2020, during the George Floyd uprisings, many young people in this country and other places around the world realized that we're facing a collapsing system. The cold capitalist system is collapsing and it's taken down the planet and us with it. So people are recognizing that we need to have an alternative to that. We need to think of a future where the great productive capacities that we have, that capitalism has built, are used for the betterment of people. Yeah, just a great guy. He was very active until not that long. I believe his wife died within the past year. And after that, he, he wasn't really writing a lot. But just a really great guy, an exemplary scholar, an exemplary activist, a life worth living. H. Bruce Franklin, the rest in power. And so I wouldn't say we're necessarily dedicating this show to him, but it really does follow in the kind of work that he did. And I think it's really a good time to do it. It's a great confluence, right? It's Memorial Day. We're talking about Bruce Franklin. And so what I wanted to do, and, and we just came up with this, and so it's just going to be an informal chat more than anything else uh, in order to debunk in the spirit of bruce franklin the myths and the romanticization of memorial day and again this isn't a dig at vets or anything like that we have we've both done a lot of work both academic and political with veterans and on the podcast and on the podcast one of our favorite guests is graham Klumpner, who was very active in, in best for peace and we were well aware of that but clearly the political class the ruling class and the media have a, a great vested stake and romanticizing what Memorial Day is all about. And they focus on the soldiers, right? Because it is paying tribute to them. But the larger agenda is to also romanticize and legitimate American wars abroad. And we're seeing that right now, probably the most blatant and actually not very well done propaganda campaign ever with regard to Israel and Palestine, where the entire world bodies, the UN, all kinds of international courts are saying the United States is committing a genocide or Israel with the United States court. It's committing a genocide in Palestine, and the United States political class and media are saying, oh, no, it's nothing like that. And so what we want to do is actually show how what is happening today in Palestine, which is hideous and brutal, right, is exactly the basis for America's role in the world. And it always has been. So this is kind of going to be like a, a, a long durée, as the French historians would say. It's We're going to talk a little bit about the United States from its founding to the present, just in cursory ways to discuss why we need to think about Memorial Day, not just, it's cool if you want to pay tribute to vets and all, that's awesome, but 
there's a lot more to it. I just figured I'd get started by talking about kind of the basis for the United States to be founded in the 18th century. I want to start with an observation from the governor of Massachusetts, Thomas Hutchinson, who was appointed by the British and he was a, a British loyalist. But in the 1770s, while the United States Americans are ramping up this opposition to the British based on all kinds of British policies, especially mercantile policies, Thomas Hutchinson said that speculative men had figured in their minds an American empire, but in such distant ages that nobody then living could expect to see it. But as soon as the French were removed, French and Indian War, uh, a new scene opened. And I use that as a segue because Hutchinson already could observe in the 1760s and 70s that the United States was aiming to create an empire. And so one of the key elements in what the United States was doing was a way to develop power, not just continental power, but ultimately global power. And I think that's really crucial to understand because already the United States is fighting a war for independence. It's already thinking long ahead, like La Longue Durée, about what kind of country it could be, what kind of global empire it could be, right? And so we have all these books about democracy and all kinds of stuff like that. But the reality is what they wanted was independence to become a global capitalist power. And you can see that in what they do. And we could go on in, into great detail here. But as soon as the war ended, the United States, the people who ran the United States, and we're talking about the usual suspects, right? Washington and, and Jefferson and Hamilton. the Adamses. And, what's that? Hamilton. Hamilton's the biggest, right? Probably of all of those, right? Hamilton and, and uh, the Secretary of Treasury in the 18, early 1800s, Albert Gallatin. Gallatin was commissioned to do a report on what was called a report on manufacturers, right? And they went around and they did this massive survey, a sense of, uh, census of manufacturers that kind of gave evidence that America's political leaders and their economic leaders, and they could be Federalists, they could be Republican, it didn't really matter. Hamilton and, and Jefferson agreed on this, right? They're always portrayed as these great rivals, but just like today's Democrats and Republicans, right? There are certain core issues on which they're in lockstep, and that was clearly the case. And America's political and economic leaders in the early 19th century aimed to build a nation with global commercial interests, right? And they were aware it would take time and they wanted to be like Europe and, and they wanted to have this global power. And they knew that to do, to do that, you would have to have manufacturing, you would have to have industrial development, you would have to have infrastructure and markets and financing and manufacturers. Uh, and initially you do it to satisfy the home market, but the long-term goal is to create global markets and global power. And in 2024, this is still what's going on. And so I think that's important to go back and, and understand that because you can see the origins of this way back. Now, we often hear, textbooks will often talk about this era of American isolationism, right? With people like George Washington's farewell address, right? And then there's that famous line from John Quincy Adams' Fourth of July oration in 1823, where he says, America goes not abroad in search of monsters to destroy she would no longer uh, be the ruler of her own spirit. She would become the dictatress of the world. That's true. Adam said that, right? Great words. This is also the guy who developed the Monroe Doctrine. He was Secretary of State under President Monroe, right? And the Monroe Doctrine essentially said, Latin America really belongs to us. And the rest of you better keep your hands off of it. And we're going to tell these people what to do. And so you can see what the United States is doing today in a lot of places, right? We've talked about Palestine, talked about Ukraine, it's Haiti. Uh, various countries in Africa, it's widespread. So you can already see that where the goal of the United States is to develop this country at home, right, continentally, but at the same time to develop the kind of stuff you need to go further than that, to develop uh, uh, an infrastructure in the United States, to, buy, to build ships, to build canals, and to start developing interoceanic commerce, to start looking at Asia. And we're talking 1820s, 1830s, right? Usually the dates for that are set much further back. But the reality is that this stuff is already happening. The kind of stuff that you'll see developing and even more focused later is already in place before the Civil War is, right? And so you have this idea of Western expansion uh, already. The first uh, American commercial interest went to Asia in like the 1840s and 1850s. One of the key ill elements in, in uh, acquiring the Oregon Territory was for ports, Oregon and California. The real issue there, obviously, they want the land, right? But it was also really important. And you see this in everything they said, talked about, and they wrote about, was mm -hmm. they wanted ports. And, and that's where you live. And this still is in L.A., still the biggest 
Is it LA the biggest port in the United States? Yeah, I believe so. So that's not new, right? And and the kind of stuff we're hearing this Cold War today with China, right? That's essentially what they were gunning for in eighteen in the eighteen thirties, right? That almost two hundred years ago, right? The idea there's China is massive and they have all these people, and if we sell stuff there and we can invest there, and and all this kind of thing, right? Already then you see this stuff taking place in Latin America. There was talk of building an interoceanic canal, an Isthmian canal, uh, originally through Nicaragua finally comes to fruition much later than that in Panama. But already there was this thought, we need to figure out ways to be able to get to both oceans far more quickly in order to develop trade. Already, it may it may seem to talk about what's happening in Rafa today with that, but the reality is it's the same mindset and right. these are the same core values. Yeah. So already you can see the United States develop this idea of becoming a manufacturing power and an empire. And that really takes hold after the Civil War. The Civil War is important because it it gets rid of the slavery issue, settles it, right? Right in the South. Kind of the South did rise again and Southern ideas dominated the U.S. And that's where we are today, right? Hmm. Like going into Confederacy II or whatever, right? With with Trump, you get Civil War II. With Biden, you get you know, World War III, right? But in the, and the, and the period after the Civil War, because the slavery issue was no longer the most dominant issue in the United States, commerce became even more important. And because of industrialization, industrial revolution, the United States manufacturers, both industrial manufacturers and agriculture, were producing far more goods than they could use in the home market. And this led to the search for new markets. That's the key element in all that, right? And that, of course, Lisa, you took classes with me. What are those two four-letter words that are always out there right, when I teach? The United States was trying to develop an open door, right? My students right. always laugh because they'll say it in unison and they'll laugh. But it's it's after the Civil War that you develop this idea. The United States says, okay, we're not a big, powerful country like the Europeans are. Uh, we're not like the British Empire, the French Empire, German Empire, anything like that. And the United States can't be, right? It has a small Navy. It has a small military. It's still basically a third world country, right? With heavy state support of industry and subsidies and all that kind of stuff, which comes from Gallup and, and Hamilton, right? And they can't do that yet. So they need to find these foreign markets. Mm -hmm. And that becomes the basis of what the Secretary of State, John Hay, would call the open door in 1899. But you can go back a century prior to that. And John Adams, during the War for Independence in the 1770s, developed what he called a model treaty, which would be a, a, a basic a model treaty for relations with other countries that would be based not on military alliances or anything like that, but on commercial interests trade for everybody. And so the United States, even though it wasn't in a position to demand free markets or anything like that, clearly understood that eventually, if you acquire enough power, you can do that, right? And and that finally, yeah, go ahead. Can I ask, can I ask one question? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. There's, there's another talking about industrialization and the growth of industrial ag and kind of ag based on wage labor, that sort of thing, is that we also see the need for uh, a, a source of labor which is why we see an upsurge in, one of the reasons we see an upsurge in immigration in the second half of the 19th century, correct? But that also leads to inequity and, and social stratification, which leads to unrest. And that's also an element in this as well, correct? Absolutely. Yeah, immigration is a labor issue, right? And it still is. And it was, but yeah, clearly in the period after this, especially as you get toward the end of the 19th and early 20th century, this one significant numbers of Germans and Irish and Italians, all these folks come in. And when we're talking about these ideas, the state, trying to develop policies in order to create global commerce. Isn't that the military industrial complex? That's they're not doing that yet. Keep in mind, the United States is so basically a third world country in the late mm -hmm. 1800s. But the kinds of stuff that we're seeing today, these kind of state and private sponsorships, these collaborations are already in place. And because of industrialization, which has been sponsored by the state, you now have significant levels of overproduction. They're just making way more stuff and producing way more commodities, agricultural commodities, the people in the United States can consume. You're not going to start making less stuff, right? Raytheon and General Dynamics aren't going to make fewer weapons. They're going to find new people to sell them to, right? Which is why I remember back in 2022, you were reading tweets from Raytheon and General Dynamics, how they were just gleeful over what was going on in, with Russia massing troops at the border, right? And obviously we're seeing that today. It seems like every other week now, Biden is sending many billions more to Palestine, right? This is a, a massive 
talking about welfare program, right? For manufacturing, weapons manufacturing, right? This, this might be a tangent, but every time I think about this sort of what you're talking about, I always think about the fight song of the Marines from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. But because if you look at the halls of Montezuma and the shores of Tripoli, if you look at those historical foreign policy adventure interventions, that's this is exactly what we're talking about. And that's what yeah. they have built into their culture. It's fascinating. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, there's, there's various aspects. Two of the most important are, one, you're looking at, at markets, right? So you want to find people who can buy the stuff you make. And But the other part of that is sometimes that has to be coercive. So the United States talks about an open door. And an open door simply means that in contrast to the empires of Europe, which are closed systems, right? It's like the U.S. and or not the United States, the colonies in Britain in the 1760s and 70s, right? You had these navigation acts. So the United States wasn't allowed to trade with anybody but the British because it was colony. So even if they got a better price, they couldn't trade with, they couldn't sell their goods. They'd smuggle shut, but they couldn't trade goods with France or Germany. They had to trade with Britain and they had to buy everything they needed from the British too. So it's a captive market, right? And that's the way the Brit the, the Europeans did it. The United States, as I said before, doesn't have the power. It doesn't have the military to do that. So it claims it wants an open door. America's advantage after the Civil War is going to be economic. It's going to be financial. It's going to be material. It's going to be based on production. And there's clearly throughout running throughout this entire period from the 18th century onward is a materialist motivation for all this. So you have issues like manifest destiny and missionaries are going abroad and they want to bring salvation and Christianity and save their souls and all that kind of stuff. But the reality is, is that the prevailing interests are materialist, right? You want to find places where you can invest countries where you can go in and establish a foothold, either through coercion or better, if you can do it, would be through bankers, right? So-called dollar diplomacy. It was a Taft said, we're going to replace bullets. We're going to replace bullets with dollars, right? We're going to place soldiers yeah. with bankers, right? And that becomes the basis for this, right? Now, that didn't mean that they weren't going to be coercive, that the open door was simply going to be uh, an exercise in, in economic strength, because the U.S. still couldn't do that in the 1890s. Remember, there's a huge depression in the United States. And one of the ways to get out of it actually was to look for markets. And this is when, in 1898, the United States, well, even before that, the United States acquired by force, took Hawaii. And then in 1898, the, the major uh, battlegrounds were, were Cuba and the Philippines, right? And Cuba is important because it's an area close to the United States, huge levels of U.S. investment. And Philippines is interesting too. And Hawaii and Philippines both are interesting, right? Because where are they located? Where are they located? The Pacific, the Pacific. And if you want to actually create an open door, which is uh, based on the Asian market, especially the Chinese market, right? Then you don't have nuclear, nuclear carriers or anything like carriers or nuclear subs or anything like that. So you need areas along the way for coaling stations. And that's why the Philippines and places like Pearl Harbor are really critical. And the United States is starting to expand so these guys like they're starting to reopen and rebuild bases in the Philippines. Yeah. And which we thought were gone after Mount Pinatubo erupted. But right. now you got that. What's Marcos's son? What's his nickname? I forget. But he's doing the same thing. Um, um, oh, I'm blanking on it. A, Bang or bomb. Yeah, something yes. like that. <laughs> it sounds like one of the women Trump paid off, doesn't it? <laughs> so you start to see that. And, and clearly now the United States is embarked on this path toward global power. And it's going to do it based on its economic power rather than its military power. But in the early part of the 20th century, you start to see military incursions with some frequency. Some are very well known. Nicaragua, Haiti, Dominican Republic, interestingly enough, all areas that would continue to be targets of the United States. Cuba, of course, right? Things didn't just end. They still are today. Haiti is still in distress right now. It's incredible there. It's chaotic, right? And this is one of the Clinton's great triumphs, right? Uh, Haiti actually had a progressive elected leader, uh, Jean-Bertrand Aristide, and the Clintons helped depose him. The great defenders of democracy, the good guys, right? The Clintons, right? <laughs> so all this stuff is going on, and that leads to the 20th century, which I think is better known. And we don't need to go into a long history lesson. We just have a, a conversation about this. But the kind of stuff that was going on, you see come to fruition during World War I. Uh, the United States did not play a big military role in World War I. It couldn't. It just wasn't able to do that. The U.S. Had, didn't even have much of a Navy until uh, after that, right? And what was the basis? If, if anybody, one of the most influential people in U.S. military history is Alfred Thayer Mahan, who was an admiral who wrote one of the most important books in U.S. military or any kind of history, The Influence of Sea Power Upon History. And it's interesting because if you read the very first 
page, I believe, in that. Mahan says that the purpose of a navy, its central focus is to protect commerce, right? Not to defend the country, not to defend democracy or anything like that. It's to protect commerce. And we're going to see that time and time again mm. right, in the 20th century. We still see that today, right? Why is the United States pissed off at the Houthi rebels? Because they're they're interfering traffic. with sea traffic. Interfering with sea traffic. And they made that clear, right? A few years ago on Saturday afternoons during college football season, the Navy had this massive ad campaign about what the Navy does. And they're not hiding this because like kind of one of the first things they said is the Navy protects 90% of the commerce in the world. That's the purpose. That's the point of it all, right? So what you're seeing today, because people want to talk about civilizations and religion and Jews and Muslims and all this kind of stuff. I mean, rogue I'm not rogue states and terrorists. Yeah, rogue states. I'm not saying that has nothing to do with it. But the focus for these guys still is based on these materialist interests, which is jumping ahead. But I think that's one of the reasons you see this global division now over Israel, because a lot of these countries say that's not really in our interest to defend Israel. The United States has this kind of particular policy, this doctrine for the entire Middle East. And the Europeans aren't quite on board in the same way. Maybe the British are, but the rest of them are starting to. Definitely not the work. Irish and the Spanish and the Norwegians Spanish, this Norwegians. week. And then I believe even even Macron has made statements about Israel essentially attacking them, right? So all this is going on. And then World War I happened. Well, World War War, when World War I began, the Great War began, the United States was a debtor country, right? It had massive economic production, had industrial output that surpassed anybody in the world. Right after the Civil War, the United States, I believe, was the fourth biggest manufacturing country after Germany, Britain, and, and, and France. By 1900, it was first. And I believe at some point it actually exceeded those countries combined. I might be wrong on the exact numbers there, but it's close to that, right? So in World War I, America's role is more economic. And that was why Woodrow Wilson got involved in it, right? Wilson's was never neutral in the war. Wilson, as much as any American president ever, was a liberal. And liberalism, remember, belong, believes in markets and empires. Liberalism is not a, a pacifist. Liberalism is militarist, right? Liberal militarism is, it's almost uh, redundant, right? That's what it believes in, right? I keep thinking of that great scene in Reds where uh, John Reed is at the liberal club in San Francisco out your way. Uh, have you ever spoken there? Have they invited you yet? <laughs> Still waiting. Uh, Invitations so, in the mail, I'm sure. And and this big pompous guy, blowhard, talking about patriots, he says, Jack Reed is back from Russia and he's going to tell us what this war from Mexico and he's going to tell us what this war is about. And John Reed stands up and he says, profits. <laughs> and then people look at me and say, profits. And that's about it. That's where we are. And that's why Wilson gets interested involved in the war. What was happening in the water? What was happening in the ocean during World War I? When the, the, United the German U-boats were sinking U.S. ships that were taking supplies to England and mm -hmm. France. And those supplies were getting sunk and... On, and, Money is being lost. They, and if they did drop those off, then they're bringing back with gold, with specie. And that's getting lost, too. So when Wilson said that the, this is a war to make the world safer democracy, everybody kind of giggles in my class. But he wasn't lying because that's what democracy is, right? It's being able to transship goods. It's being able to sell weapons to another country. It's being able to attack another country via the mechanisms of international law, defending Britain's uh, starvation blockade, but attacking Germany for using subs, which weren't even covered under international law at, at the time, right? Mm -hmm. And because the Germans were using these U-boats to attack American ships, Wilson intervened to make the world safer democracy. When he talked in his uh, war address, he talked about free seas, right? Free commerce. And that's what he meant. So democracy, obviously, we didn't mean what we consider democracy. He didn't care about that. We know that. Gene Debs was sentenced to 10 years, right? Uh, black soldiers were lynched during World War I. Germans were attacked during World War I. How many people, anarchists and Italians and others, were arrested and deported during World War I? Or jailed, right? yeah. So, or jailed. So it had nothing to do, look at Debs' famous speech, right? So it had nothing to do with what we would consider democracy. This is about markets. It's about power. At the time the war ended, because the United States had bankrolled it to a large degree, the United States had gone into World War I, to the Great War, as a, as a debtor country, holding about $10 billion in debt. By the time the war was over, the United States was the biggest creditor, holding about $10 billion in credits. And it became a global power yeah. through that, through global commerce, right? And then you have the disasters of the interwar years, the, the rise of Nazi Germany and all that, and then World War II, where this comes to fruition, again, because America's military power, right? World War II is a war for the open door. 
and keep that in mind too, because we're seeing a lot of comparisons now between Germany in the 30s and 40s and Israel today, right? That never concerned the US in the 30s and 40s, right? The United States wasn't really concerned about what Hitler was doing domestically, right? Any more than Biden gives a shit about Netanyahu butchering people and killing kids and killing, uh, blowing up hospitals and killing doctors and all that other stuff. And Biden's made it clear. He's not hiding that, right? He's just either denying it or dismissing it or making up lies about it, right? He's still insisting that he saw pictures of things that have now been debunked, right? And World his War own II, staff says that he never saw those pictures. Or his own staff, right? And in World War II, that was what's going on, right? So everybody's talking about things like what the Japanese were doing in the Pacific or the Germans and the Holocaust and everything. The real issue there was Germany and Japan threatened the entire structure of the global economy, the open door, mm -hmm. right? If Germany wins, then Europe is closed. And that's bad for obviously the British and the French, but the United States too, which is heavily dependent on trade with those European countries. And the same with Japan. If Japan wins and creates a greater East Asia pro-prosperity sphere, then the open doors move irrelevant. It, it just, it's also important to point out that the Americans and the British were fine with the Germans and the Italians exactly. in the 30s when they were going after communists. Exactly. But once it turns on the Western, the more Western countries then it, and threatens trade and the economy, it becomes a bigger problem. Yeah, National Socialist ideology saw this confluence between Jews and communists, right? Because a lot of the early Bolsheviks were Jewish. Mm -hmm. And so that was just, and when that was the, and, and right, the United States had no issues with that. They were fine. The entire world, global ruling class, like Hitler's on our side, right? He hates the communists. That's why they sat out the span of civil war. They were nonplussed by the emergence of, of Mussolini and Hitler until really you start to see much later, really France, I think is really the, obviously the invasion of Poland in, in 1939. When Hitler goes after France, that's when, that's the, what I say, it's the oh shit moment. Oh, this is legit, right? Yeah. Up to that point, that's why you had appeasement, because they didn't perceive it as being a, a direct threat, right? What he was doing is not just what German leaders had done, it's what Europeans had done. And attacking Jews didn't take the European and American ruling class by shock, because that's what they had always done. The Merchant of Venice was written in 1598. The French so, have a long history of anti-Semitism. French, yeah, they're coming out of the Dreyfus Affair earlier in the 20th century, right? So that wasn't it. But it was a war for the open door. And that's what terrified the United States. And that, of course, led to American success with the atomic bomb. And then after that, you see the creation of the greatest empire, I, I think, in global history, right? And we can quibble about like when it started, when it ended, or whatever. But you had, in the early Cold War years, the United States developed this national security apparatus, uh, both to develop the means to fight wars abroad, to create a culture of war in the United States, and to create a domestic surveillance system, which again, we're seeing today, right? So all this stuff, nothing is by shock, nothing is by surprise. It's horrible, it's bad, it's outrageous, it's just not new, right? And that throughout the Cold War, and then you really start the ramping up of major wars, big wars, in places like Korea and Vietnam and elsewhere. And so what we're seeing today what we're seeing today on this Memorial Day weekend is what we're supposed to be seeing. It was the basis for the construction, for the invention uh, of the United States, and especially for American foreign policy. And this is something that we've spent, personally, much of our lives fighting against. I got involved uh, on, a, on a fairly serious level during the 1980s, during the, the wars on Nicaragua and, and El Salvador and elsewhere in, in Central America. And what's also connected to the kind of organizing you do about globalization and, and the environment, too. And, and Bruce Franklin understood that, right? He really understood that. We can just talk a little bit about what's happening today and talk about how it connects, because I, I think what we're seeing right now is probably, I think, the, the biggest example of it, really, for in a long time. Obviously, you had the first Gulf War in the 1990s, you had the second Gulf War. But I'm, and those segue into what we're doing today, but I think what we're seeing today with these two wars on these fronts, and especially what's happening in Israel, which is really, I, I can't think of any, even Vietnam, and I didn't, I was, was, wasn't was around for the actual coverage of Vietnam, but I certainly know a lot about it. But I think what we're seeing today, largely because of social media with regard to Israel and, and Palestine, is in many ways the most extreme example of all this, right? And a lot of people are shocked by it, and they're saying, this isn't what America stands for. And but it is. It's exactly what America stands for. Biden is American. He's as American as it gets. He has been his whole life. Oh. Yeah, he very much comes out of this sort of 
Cold War mentality. And this is he was a he was elect, first elected to the Senate in 1972. 72. And staying with what he sees as these longtime alliances, whether it's with the Europeans and in, in Europe around the war in Ukraine, or whether it's with Israel in the Middle East, this is who he is. And we talk a lot about how liberals want to maintain stability. We on the show we've talked more about that around domestic politics, but I, I think we also see the sort of foreign policy and the military intervention that the U.S. has a long history of. Is that's what they're also trying to do there? Is they want to maintain stability just for the open door to keep these markets open. Uh, whether it's from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. I don't know why I keep I'm focusing on that today, but it's, it's, I think that's like an important thing to point out here is that the U S sees itself as this sort of global policeman to basically protect the interests of its, of the ruling class, definitely in the U S and I would actually say in other parts of the industrial world, industrial yeah. arms world. What's well, as Phil Oak said, we're the cops of the world, right? That could be the outro song today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And when you've done way more on this too, is, there's an economic there's an economic focus going on in Gaza today, right? There are American oil companies, there are American weapons manufacturers. There are interests there that for the United States to focus on this global slaughter by narrowly talking about Hamas on October 7th shows just how empty they are. They got nothing, right? Yeah. If one of the key elements of wars is proportionality, right? You you attack people with kind of some level of proportion of what they did to you, right? If October 7th is the basis for what Israel's doing, that is the most disproportionate attack you could have, right? Uh, and we can go back, obviously, this thing doesn't begin on October 7th. And we don't have to talk about that because if you don't understand that, then nothing to talk about. But uh, this is incredibly disproportionate. So why? What are they looking for? What are they trying to do there? And I know you've talked a lot about Chevron and, and a lot of these companies. And I think that really needs to get out there more often. Um, Chevron is, you know, what, what's Chevron doing right now? They're developing gas fields in the Eastern Mediterranean. They're building an energy hub actually just north of Gaza, I believe. I guess it's in Israeli territory. But you, and, and I definitely am not an expert on this. And I think we should have a show on this sometime soon. Yeah. But but they are they're very interested in developing fossil fuels in the region and dealing with what they see as a problematic area as Gaza is they're like all in support of that. And, and that goes back to what you said a minute ago. You said Gaza, they consider a problem area, right? Which means it's unstable, right? And yeah. this clearly is the state. The United States, remember, it had the Abraham Accords, which was a scam, right? The United States has pivoted towards Saudi for some time now, even though Saudi blew up <laughs> the World Trade Center, right? What's happening now is incredibly destabilizing, which is why I think the United States and Israel are willing to just say, fuck it, to the world and continue this slaughter. And... Yeah. I would say, and we've had some ex actual experts, journalists, and academics on to talk about this, but if the pattern fits and they're doing this to Hamas, everyone is a Hamas supporter at some point or another, if you say anything against Israel, but how long before they decide to go into southern Lebanon and get into a bigger, a wider conflict with Hezbollah, for example? Or, Israel's already, is, or Israel's, Iran. already yeah, Israel's already staging cross-border attacks that attack the, the Iranian consulate in, in Damascus, right? Mm -hmm. So this entire region is being destabilized, right? And on one hand, and I've said this myself, it's like, what the hell are they thinking? Who didn't see this coming? Biden is clearly willing to turn the country back over to Trump in order to defend Israel's slaughters, ethnic cleansing, genocides, whatever you want to call it, right? Yes. And when it, it, on one level, you think that's insane. It doesn't make any sense, but it actually does, right? Because it, it creates this. I think saying that Trump, sure, Biden's doing genocide, but Trump would do more genocide. I'm not sure that's a winning issue. I'm not sure that's my campaign slogan, right? All right? Trump would be doing the same thing, but that, so what? The fact of the matter is this is incredibly destabilizing. What's happening right now is incredibly destabilizing in my gut assumption based on nothing, right? Other than like studying this stuff for a long time, but really I have no specific knowledge of any of this is that they just decided they want to end it. They want to get that region under control. And for a long time, Israel was the cop on the beat. It still is, but so is Saudi before 1978, so was Iran under the Shah, right? Egypt and so, is. Egypt, right? And that's another factor that, you know, and this is one area where the conservatives have a point. It's bullshit and disingenuous on their part. But the other Arab countries, other than rhetorically, aren't doing anything to help the Palestinians. They really aren't. There are Egyptian hucksters who are getting tens of thousands of dollars from families to try to get 
people out of Gaza. They can do that. They have a, an agreement with Israel, a licensing system, right? They're just taking the money and pocketing it. So the entire region is destabilized by this, right? And they're focusing on this particular thing. But the reality is that Hamas has really mucked up the entire thing, or the Gaza, the, the resistance, right? Has really mucked up the entire project for them. They have this problem. And I have no idea what the timing of October 7th was. There were reports just like days before that, that Israel and Saudi were going to come to some kind of an, an agreement on recognition. And that's obviously on the back burner now. But it's the 50th anniversary of the Yom Kippur War, because we actually did a show on that like the day before. Right. On right, October right. So there's so much of this is going on. But to say, and that's why the charges of anti-Semitism, which is an old ploy, right? But it's so dirty. It's so freaking dirty to simply do that because they have nothing. What else can they say? Yeah. They can't argue this on any particular level. And they're not going to come right out and say, hey, we're doing this because the oil companies and the weapons manufacturers want us to do it. And if you question it, you're anti-Semitic and it's an old trope. Think of Woodrow Wilson going after Debs and calling people Bolsheviks and anarchists and terrorists and all that kind of stuff. They said that about the, the Viet Cong. They were comparing Ho Chi Minh to, to Hitler and the outside agitator memes, the tropes, nothing. Saddam, Saddam Hussein was compared to Hitler. Saddam, Saddam Hussein was the new Hitler. Saddam and Ho Chi Minh were the new Hitlers, and, which is just utterly preposterous on a, on a lot of different levels. It's Memorial Day. And of course, since it's Memorial Day, the keep in mind too is, you know, how many millions, not not plural millions, but a hell of a lot of Americans have died in these wars, right? If you want to count the Civil War, it would be millions, right? World War I, World War II, various conflicts, Vietnam and so forth, Korea and so forth, right? Why did they die? To protect America? Thank you for protecting my freedom. Thank you for your service. And again, not to re, not to insult them, not at all, but they were cogs. They were being used to pursue this imperial material agenda mm -hmm. and had nothing to do with democracy unless you define democracy the way Woodrow Wilson did, which is what Americans actually usually have. That's what liberal, that's liberalism, right? Yeah. So this is a liberal ideology. This is a liberal mission. It's been around since as long as the United States has been actually precedes the actual founding of, of the United States, the War for Independence, the, the Peace Treaty and the Constitution, it precedes that, right? I was talking about the Model Treaty in the 1760s, right? And it goes through these things we've talked about, the report on manufacturers and the Monroe Doctrine and plans to develop a canal and Perry bombarding uh, Japan and so on and so on. It's the open door and overproduction and all this kind of stuff. And it just, it's just, it's, and what we're seeing now is just the last, Sometimes I wouldn't say the triumph of it, it triumphed a long time ago, and it's certainly not the last phase because the United States is currently sanctioning Venezuela and Iran and Cuba, of course, strangling the hell out of Cuba. You want to talk about killing children in Gaza, which is doing, it's doing that in Cuba too, maybe not yeah. as violently yeah. and forcefully, but Cuba is right now undergoing a, a horrible shortage of food and baby formula and stuff like that, right? Because of the embargo. And this embargo is killed. And, and destroy you know, the Cuban economy and kill Cubans. And, and I, think, I think it's something like the U.S. This isn't even including Gaza and Palestine. Is the U.S. has something has active troops on the ground in six or seven conflicts around the world, mostly in the Middle East and Africa. Yeah, and it not and that doesn't include the embargo they do on Cuba, the embargo they do on Venezuela. It's just brutal. It, make, it, it actually makes me think of the. Smedley Butler, who wrote War is a Racket, who has a great quote where he said he spent most of his time as a high class muscle man for big business for Wall Street and the bankers. Yep. Uh, he was a racketeer and a gangster for capitalism. Yeah. What's funny about that is, is that's actually Trump is pretty candid about that, right? Mm -hmm. After they after they bone saw it, shit, I forgot the name, Khashoggi, right? Mm -hmm. Trump's, yeah, but they buy a lot of weapons from us. Like Trump has that habit of saying like, like the quiet part out loud and giving it away. But that's a, a, exactly what's happening here. And it's important to understand that because I know it's election year and the liberals are going to be out in full force, throwing guilt on you like an Italian grandmother, like a Catholic <laughs> grandmother or whatever. And you got to vote for Biden, the lesser of evils. He's more accountable. Blah, blah. And Biden is doing what he's always done, what Americans have always done, right? It's funny. We've actually spent a lot of time on this podcast talking about Jimmy Carter, who uh, apparently is, is entering his final days or you know, close to it. And as his post-presidency is exemplary, it's inspirational in some ways, right? As president, he was a war criminal, a brutal war criminal, right? All yeah. over. And that's what they are. Now, Biden, it's funny, I used to 
say Biden is just Nixon. Nixon actually forged the detente with China and the Soviet Union. Biden is gangbusters about fomenting war with both of them, right? And Taiwan is on the back burner right now, but that's a, another a case of this, right? Mm -hmm. Where there is no, this is a clear violation of international law, which we've already seen the U.S. doesn't give a shit about, right? It's already said we're not going to accept In fact, they're going to defund certain agencies at the U.N. and the international courts because they are calling Israel genocidal and they've put out uh, an arrest warrant for, for a BB, right? For Nanny. Lindsey Graham today in, in a, a Senate committee actually praised the administration and actually, I think it was yesterday when he was talking to Blinken, praised Biden for order, ordering sanction, sanctions of the International Criminal Court because they issued those warrants. This is we we talk a, a lot about how you know Republicans and Democrats are at each other and the next civil war is coming. But it's when it comes to what's really important to the ruling class, they're completely bipartisan. Yeah, it's a two-headed pig eating at the same trough. Yeah. And that's who Joe Biden is. And if you want to one vote- One party with two right wings. <laughs> one party with two right wings, Gore right? And if people want to vote, that's fine. But the idea of pressuring and guilting people is bullshit. And then, of course, once it's over, if, which I think is very likely Biden loses, you're gonna you're not going to hear anything about this. They're not going to say stop genocide. They're going to say it's because of Bobby Kennedy Jr., who's a lunatic, right? Or it's Cornell West, or it's Jill Stein, or it's Russia, or what, Right. It's ironic, right? For what, eight freaking years, the Democratic Party has been all in on Russia, right? You know which country has interfered in American politics a zillion times more than Russia ever could? Israel. Israel, <laughs> right? You want to find a country which dominates American politics, right? They just kicked, they just knocked out, what was it, I forget, in what state in the elections, in the primaries, right? It was the, or they did it, they do it, they did it in multiple primaries this multiple year, primaries, but they, yeah. it's, it's the big news has been around. Shoshana Jayapal's primary in, yeah. in Oregon, in the Portland area. Yeah. Yes, APAC is throwing in $100 million. It always has. It's coordinating with uh, the mayor of New York to send out the dogs against peaceful protesters, right? Mm -hmm. It's creating this equivalence where, you know, oh, the students broke a window. You killed 15,000 kids. The students broke a window. It's a wash, right? Reminds me of The Simpsons remember when Homer says, Sure, Marge, I burned down the house, but you have a gambling problem. You yeah, know? exactly. <laughs> and that's Biden, right? So on this Memorial Day, pay tribute to people who who served and especially those who lost their lives. It's tragic. And both of us have, like I said, relationships with people who are in the military and we respect and admire what they do. But that's not what this is about. This is a this weekend is is propaganda, it's a myth, it's a romanticization. It's a heroicization in order to avoid the fact that we're all less safe and we're all less prosperous because of yeah. this. Like Bruce Franklin said, it's just more myth making in America. Yeah, it is. It's it is. And, and again, if any of Bruce Franklin's stuff is good, just go online and Google them and read whatever. But am I or myth making America? Easy book to read. Just reads it flows really well. And it's really great because it takes this idea that pretty much everybody believed, right? It's like the atomic bomb, the stuff Garo Perovitz did on the bomb, which I talk about a lot. Those are two great examples of it. Or uh, the spitting image by Jerry Lemke about all the mm -hmm. vets were spat upon when they got home by the hippies. Oh, it never happened, actually, right? No, no recorded, I mean, no, no recorded incident. No, ever. no. And so you have these myths, and we're seeing that today, right? I mean, there's so many today, right? The myth of the anti-Semitism on campus, the myth of from the river to the sea, the myth of uh, October 7th, uh, 2023 is the start of all this. They're just abundant, right? And if uh, if Americans, I don't think Americans will be in a combat role, but there's no doubt American soldiers are going to die somewhere going forward. And it's just important to understand why that happened. It's ironic, right? In Vietnam, the United States had almost 60,000 people killed. And what, about 20 years later, 30 years later, American corporations are investing in Vietnam and Clinton and Anthony Bourdain are having lunch and had no, I'm sorry, Obama and Anthony Bourdain are having lunch and, and everybody's friends now. They killed 60,000. We hated them. They were the worst people in the world. And now they are, they're Americans' economic outlet. And at some point, if the money's there, I still fear, I dread the day that there's like a Trump hotel on the Malacan in Havana, right? Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, I don't like saying happy Memorial Day. I think that's a weird thing to say because it's not a happy day. But by all means, enjoy the barbecues and the baseball or whatever, the families. But keep in mind that this is America. This is what we are and whatever we can do. I don't know what that is. I don't have any 
magic bullets, but I think Raytheon has all the magic bullets and they're just not selling it for us. So. They're, too, they're, they're more than our bank accounts can handle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But America does go abroad in search of monsters to destroy. Yeah, and, exactly. uh, and it's clearly had an impact on our, our democratic institutions. You can see that on campuses. There's like 150 campuses have encampments and the brutality with which these people are getting attacked by these cops uh, who are coordinating it with um, groups like business groups and New York's mayor, who's a vicious SOB, right? Uh, corrupt, vicious SOB is coordinating with these private groups who are assisting them, right? And then the police the, are going The billionaire them. class. Right? Billionaire class. The police are attacking people. They're destroying people's lives. You have uh, white shoe law firms and investment houses, which are saying that if anybody participated in, in a, a protest on campus, they're going to uh, destroy their credibility. They're doxing people. These, um, I mean, the, the billionaires are hiring private investigators at the MIPD and investigating student groups like right. Students for Justice in Palestine and Jews, Jewish yep. Forces for Peace. Yeah, and I mean, that's you I talk think, about outside agitators. These are the real outside oh, agitators. Of course. And uh, I, I got to say that the media, like the New York Times and Washington Post, are have, have finally come around a bit because they both written um, articles this week, which are are pretty devastating about the uh, UCLA protest and how outside groups came in how the cops just sat there and let them do their thing and how these people were like, you had IDF veterans in it and you had people who APAC sent there. And uh, wasn't Jerry Seinfeld's wife, one of the the back? The, yeah, maybe she and Ginny Thomas could get together and start like the the women's auxiliary of war criminals or something like that, yeah. along with Hillary Clinton and Nancy Pelosi and the late Madeleine Albright and others. Yeah, right? Exactly. That's, that's their liberals. So anyway, a happy time, but I think it's important to understand. People claim they want to understand history. If you're going to do that, you need to get all of it. You can't just do the happy parts and create myth and, and romance. And here we are. Yep. Folks, you've been listening to the our Memorial Day episode, which myth-making in America is what Memorial Day is. If you like what you're hearing, check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you're watching this on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. If you're listening to this on one of the mini podcasts, platforms that we're on audio platform how platforms we're on give us a rate and review helps us with the algorithms and if you really like us you can buy a hat we've had some recent hat purchases nice green and red trucker hat that bob's wearing and then you can also buy a copy of bob's first book masters of war just email us at green red podcast at gmail and we'll get one to you at ASAP. And then also, if you want to just make a donation, go to greenredpodcast.org and hit the support button or become a patron at patreon.com backslash greenredpodcast. Speaking of Bruce Franklin, one last thing. This is great at destroying the myth of Kennedy in Vietnam. So if you want to, that, if that's your thing, man, check it out. Yeah, because and that's what I we mean, live when, to do here. We, we go yeah. myth busting on this Green Red yeah. podcast all the time. Yeah, when Franklin, I thought of him a lot when I was writing this, actually. So. Until next time. Misbehave, make a lot of trouble, and we'll talk again soon. Come get out of the way, boys. Quick, get out of the way. You'd better watch what you say, boys. Better watch what you say. We've rammed in your harbor and tied to your port And our pistols are hungry and our tempers are short So bring your daughters around to the fore Cause we're the cops of the world, boys We're the cops of the world We pick and choose as we please, boys Pick and choose as we please You'd best get down on your knees, boy Best get down on your knees